Hi, and thanks for listening in. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Seahorse XF Analyzer, what it is, how it works, and how we in the Contract Services Division go about optimizing our XF assays so that you, the customer, get the best possible outcome. The Seahorse XF, or Extracellular Flux Analyzer, is an incredibly important and powerful tool used for measuring cellular bioenergetics. Before the invention of XF technology, researchers used a Clark type or polarographic oxygen electrode, which, while extremely accurate, were incredibly low throughput using a single or in some cases a double measurement chamber. The XF analyzer uses a specialized plastics embedded with oxygen and pH sensitive probes to accurately measure oxygen concentration and extracellular pH in a 24 or 96 well format. The software will then calculate change in oxygen and pH versus time and display oxygen consumption rate or OCR values or extracellular acidification rate or ECAR values. The specialized plastics, known as flux packs, are also outfitted with four injection ports so that various control compounds can be injected during the assay. However, to better understand this, we should talk in more detail about the flux packs. The flux pack cartridge consists of two main parts, the center portion in green and the clear utility plate. An XFE96 flux pack is shown on this slide. The upper portion of the sensor interfaces with the instrument and contains for each well four injection ports labeled A through D and a guide for each of the 96 probes that excite and measure the phosphorescence and fluorescence intensity of the oxygen and pH sensors found at the lowermost portion of the sensor plate. The piston-shaped lower portion of the sensor plate not only contains the oxygen and pH sensor, but also works in concert, in concert with uniquely shaped wells found in both the utility plate and the cell plate to create the measurement chamber. This facilitates mixing following, inje following injections. Before an assay can be performed, the flux pack must first be hydrated, typically overnight, injection wells must be filled, and the cartridge calibrated. Once calibration is complete, the utility plate is exchanged for a cell plate containing the pre-plated cells. A typical measurement cycle consists of a mix step, where the piston is slowly raised and lowered, followed by a measurement step, where the probes are lowered to create a measurement chamber. The unique design of the Seahorse and Seahorse consumables allow for a number of assays to be performed with one of the most popular being the mitochondrial stress test. The mitochondrial stress test is a means of measuring respiratory control, or rather measuring the capacity of the cellular mitochondria to cope with various stressors with well-known established mechanism of action. Within the cells, and assuming no limitations to substrate availability, mitochondrial oxygen consumption is driven by proton motor force. Proton motor force is a combination of electrical and pH gradients that can exist across the inner mitochondrial membrane. The proton motor force is utilized by the ATP synthase to phosphorylate ADP to ATP, driven by cellular energy demand. As the cell's energy demand goes up, the greater the utilization of this proton motor force and the faster the rate of oxygen consumption. In a in the situation where all ADP is phosphorylated into ATP, oxygen consumption will slow down and be governed primarily by proton leak, or this leak across the inner mitochondrial membrane. In actively respiring cells, this basal rate of, of oxygen consumption is occurring as the cells are phosphorylating ADP um, in accordance with their normal energy demand. In the mitochondrial stress test, we take these first four measurements and then inject different stressors to challenge the mitochondria. The first one of these is oligomycin, which is a complex V inhibitor. Oligomycin prevents the phosphorylation of ADP and therefore minimizes the cell's energy demand. As you can see by this trace here, um, this is our new oxygen consumption rate following the addition of oligomycin. This rate of respiration, when we account for non-mitochondrial respiration at the end, and we'll get to that, is roughly equivalent to our proton leak. Following our oligomycin measurements, we then add FCCP, which is an uncoupler. It's a protonophore that depolarizes the mitochondrial membrane and in essence maximizes leak. Following FCCP addition, the electron transport chain is no longer governed by the existence of a membrane potential. As a result, it goes as fast as it possibly can, limited only by substrate availability, substrates being uh, reducing equivalence as well as oxygen concentrations. 
After the addition of FCCP, we add electron transport inhibitors rotenone and antimycin. This stops the flow of electrons through the electron transport chain to complex four, and it and effectively stops mitochondrial oxygen consumption. Once we've obtained all of these measurements, we can clearly see that we have a nice looking trace and can calculate all of these different things from regards to the spare capacity, which is the basal minus the maximal, or rather the maximal minus the basal. Uh, we have our the amount of oxygen being used for ATP synthesis. We have our proton leak and our non-mitochondrial respiration following the addition of the antimycin A and rotenone. All of these parameters provide very, very, very important information that can be very, very useful provided the system is optimized properly. So what do I mean by that? The first part of optimization of any mitochondrial stress test or any real seahorse experiment is to perform a cell seeking titration. This should be performed before trying to interpret any kind of mitochondrial stress test data um, just to avoid the potential for um, possible artifacts. The two values that we need to pay the closest attention to when optimizing a mitochondrial stress test are the basal OCR and the maximal OCR. As a guide, it's recommended that the basal OCRs be in the range of 50 to 110 picomoles per minute. But why is that? To illustrate what I mean by this, I'm showing data from cell sheeting titration in C2C12 myoblasts. These cells were seeded at the densities indicated and cultured for 48 hours. When our culture period was up, we performed a mitochondrial stress test, which is shown above. Our basal oxygen consumption values are all below 200 picomoles per minute, and our maximal rates are just over 400 picomoles per minute. So what does this mean? In your XF software, if you switch the view from rate to level, you end up with a screen that shows the partial pressure of oxygen in millimeters of mercury, rather than OCR. Since oxygen consumption rate equals the change in oxygen concentration versus the change in time, these values give an approximation of oxygen concentration, or this time as PO2. If the cells are seeded too low, the oxygen consumption rates are low and subject to noise and inaccurate. If cell seeding density is too high, oxygen deprivation can be a concern when FCCP is added. The dashed line on the graph above indicates the partial pressure where oxygen limitation can start to be a concern. On the next slide, I'll show you an example. Based on the previous set of data, it might be hard to imagine that oxygen deprivation can be a problem. However, in this set of data, the cell seeding titration was performed on BB2 microglia cells that were seeded and cultured for two days. Right away, you can see that basal oxygen consumption rate is much higher than that with the C2C12 cells, indicating that these cells, the cell line is very aerobic. The basal OCR values for these cells, for the most part, increase with cell seeding density, with the exception of being at higher densities, which may be limited by a lack of space in the well. Upon the addition of FCCP, it becomes evident that maximal OCR values are highest in cells initially seeded at 3,000 cells per well. Had a seeding titration not been performed, this result would likely go unnoticed, resulting in lower than expected maximal OCR values and inaccurate spare capacity calculations. Looking at the oxygen concentrations in these wells, we can clearly see that this result is not resu the result of mitochondrial dysfunction, but rather due to the due to shown here with the cells seated at higher densities. Oxygen limitation is an important factor to be aware of when studying compounds that are designed to improve mitochondrial function. For example, if oxygen is limited following FCCP addition, a compound that mildly inhibits the electron transport chain may in fact yield data showing an increase in maximal oxygen consumption and spare capacity. This result would not be due to actual improvements in the oxygen consumption rate in the system, but rather the opposite. Since the electron transport chain is not consuming all the oxygen in the chamber, the rate of reaction is linear throughout the measurement window, resulting in artifactually high reading. In addition to overseeding, resulting in potentially artifactually data, high data, improper titration of couplers, in this case FCCP, is another area that has the potential to be problematic. In mitochondrial studies, encouplers are used to maximize the rate of oxygen consumption by dissipating membrane potential or maximizing leak, resulting in the maximal rate of oxygen consumption for that system. One of the more commonly used encouplers, FCCP, is a lipophilic protonophore with a pKa of around 7.4. FCCP functions by shuttling protons from the positively charged side of the membrane, which is around pH 7.4, to the negative side, around pH 7.2. When FCCP is deprotonated, the loss of the positive charge results in a migration back to the positive side of the membrane, where it's once again protonated. This cycling will continue until the delta pH is equal to zero. 
To compensate for the loss of charge, the electron transport chain will consume oxygen to translocate protons in an effort to reestablish the proton motor force. This works very well in an isolated mitochondrial system. However, FCCP does not have specificity towards mitochondrial membranes. It can cause toxicity in cells and paradoxical inhibition of the mitochondrial oxygen consumption rate if not properly titrated. Here is an FCCP titration that was performed on cells that have been optimally seeded. It's important to have consistent cell seeding when conducting these experiments, as variations in the cell number may change the end result. In this experiment, an 8-point, two-fold serial dilution was performed with FCCP. To make the oxygen consumption rate trace easier to visualize, I've removed four of the points. However, a clear inflection point is observed at the two micromolar FCCP point. These data show that at FCCP concentrations below 2 micromolar, the FCCP concentration is insufficient to facilitate maximal respiration. However, at concentrations above 2 micromolar, we start to see toxic effects of the uncoupler. This is more clearly illustrated by the bell-shaped titration curve shown on the right. So why do we care so much about optimization? While well, failure to properly optimize a cell system before performing a mitochondrial stress test can lead to a number of problems. When looking at mitochondrial biogenesis studies, overseeding the cells can result in false negatives due to oxygen limitations, where cells essentially run out of oxygen, or false positives due to inhibition resulting in a more linear respiration rate. Poorly titrated FCCP concentrations can result in the inhibition due to toxic levels of the compound, or suboptimal levels, of, suboptimal levels resulting in maximal oxygen consumption values due to inadequate concentrations. We can observe something similar with mitochondrial toxicity studies, where an excess of FCCP can result in pos false positives from mitochondrial toxicity and add to the effects of the compound, meaning the compound wasn't toxic until you added an excess of FCCP. With the case of cell seeding, as we mentioned previously, if the cells are overseeded, the addition of an inhibitor will prevent oxygen limitation, and as a result, show up as an activator and artifactually increase spare capacity. These are all things to be aware of when optimizing mitochondrial stress tests for any assay using the seahorse. On this slide, I'm showing some optimized data for a system that we've developed here in-house. These are H9C2 cells that are treated with a high glucose, high fat medium, and in a sense to try to mimic something you would see in diabetic cardiomyopathy. The vehicle DMEM, as you can see, has a relatively low basal OCR rate comparison to the, when compared to the actual treated cells, um, along with a nice response to the ligomycin, whereas the cells with the high fat, high glucose media are more uncoupled. Upon the addition of FCCP, we see a nice increase in our maximum respiration followed by inhibition of FCCP. When taking a look, closer look at the data, we can see that as we add our test compound in this situation, we can actually see a statistically significant increase in our maximal respiration rate. These data might possibly have been missed had we not done an optimal titration with the FCCP in our cell seeding densities. So this brings up the question, when do I need to optimize and how often do I need to optimize? Really, anytime there are major changes to your assay, such as new cell lines, changes in the assay conditions, media types, substrates, especially protein. BSA is a big one to be aware of. Um, additionally, culture conditions are huge. Cells that are cultured under starvation conditions, for example, low glucose and low serum, are not going to have the same tolerance for FCCP as cells that are cultured under normal or optimal growth conditions. Alternatively, if the cells are precious and hard to come by, there is an alternative to using FCCP. Um, BAM-15 is one of the, a, a relatively novel uncoupler that's been shown to be better tolerated. It has a higher specificity for mitochondria. And if you'd like more information about this, you can look up, look up our white paper um, where we categorize the differences between um, FCCP and BAM-15. Uh, and just to close, I'd like to provide everybody with some of the resources that I've used. Um, a lot of these are available online. Um, and a lot of these are, are very, very helpful. So if you want to go about optimizing your own CRF experiments, um, all the information that um, was included, as well as some additional information, uh, is included in all of these resources. And secondly, I'd like to strongly recommend anybody who has the opportunity to take the Bioenergetics Masterclass offered at the Buck Institute. Um, it's taught by Martin Brand, David Nichols, and Shona Mukherjee, um, who have done a lot of great work with the Seahorse in terms of helping to optimize it so it's the experiments that are conducted on it are done, are done properly and done well. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and be happy to take any questions.